my name is Eva, and I would like to welcome you to The Charm of It, a podcast for knitters who share my fascination with the nitty-gritty details of our craft. If you're a returning viewer, it is so nice to see you again, and if you're a new viewer, I'm really glad that you found your way to my little corner of the internet. Before I go any further, for returning viewers, there's your moth and thistle. <laughs> yeah, you know your name, huh, Pops? I shouldn't torment her like that. So, they are hanging out behind me, but they will probably not be in the frame, just because my head. <laughs> uh, I had a really great holiday break, but I am really pleased to be back in front of the camera and catch you up on everything that I've been doing. So I have several finished objects to talk about, as well as some works in progress and some needles adjacent projects. I thought that rather than talk about a knitting philosophy type question the way that I normally do because this is my first episode of 2019. I'm going to instead talk a little bit about the word I chose for this year. So that's personal, which is unusual for my podcast, but I will put it at the very end. So if you're not interested in anything but knitting, then you can just stop there. Um, I have a Schrodinger sweater segment for you, and I'm also going to work in a little more discussion about socks within the finished object and works in progress sections because as you'll see I have a lot of socks to show you and I have just had thoughts. <laughs> so I suppose that'll be kind of my knitting theme and I think that that will be more than enough to occupy us for an episode. So first up I suppose I should do finished objects. I have three pairs of socks. They are what I took to knit when I went home to Texas and unfortunately, there are never any direct flights between here and my family, so I always end up in transit for ages, and then I fly southwest for the free checked bags, and there are always horrible delays. So the upshot of that is I was able to knit five socks in ten days, I believe. So upside of terrible airplane travel, but I'd much rather just be able to blink myself back to Texas and then you know, knit at my leisure. I don't actually have the first pair to show you because I knit them for Joel and he has them and he's wearing them, but I do have a photo. So I guess I will insert that here. And so these socks, as I said, I knit them for Joel. And so the first pair of socks that I knit him, I just did a one by one ribbed cuff and then a three by one ribbed body because when I'm knitting socks for people, gift socks, I find that that one is always going to fit well, and it gives a little more room for um, fit. I'm just repeating myself now. So rather than knit a second pair of socks for him right away, we decided to just let him wear those for a while and decide if he wanted anything different. And the only changes he requested were a longer leg. I guess that's only one change. And I remember at the time I was surprised that he thought that the leg was long enough. I think I knit it to be about six inches. And luckily I had taken good notes when I knit the first pair of socks. So when I knit the second, I just followed those notes and I added, I think, 12 rounds to the leg. He wanted about another inch, so maybe I added 10. It'll be on the project page. And then I also added some rows to the heel flap to make the arch section a little longer, just because Joel's feet are pretty um, high arches, and so that way, that ends up making the leg longer, essentially. So I thought that I would go ahead and make two little changes, and then he's going to wear those and decide if he wants those changes for the next pair of socks. But he really liked how they fit when he tried them on the first time. I love being a sock scientist. Anyway, the yarn. Our friend Sarah went to Germany, and she brought me back this skein of yarn, and it's a German sock yarn. I'm not going to remember the name because I don't have the label anymore. But it was, it knit up into this fun kind of gray and white pattern, and it was a Superwash Merino silk nylon blend, I think. It's linked on the project page, so if you want this particular yarn, you'll be able to, you know, find out all the details there. But I was really impressed by how it knit up. The fabric was really nice, and I asked Joel if he wanted it for his socks before I started knitting it, and once I was knitting it, I was kind of regretting that, but. That's okay, I've got a lot of socks. <laughs> and I did do contrast cuff, heel, and toes, just because I like how that looks when the main yarn is variegated or patterned or something. I just, I don't know, I like that solid border. 
and I showed Joel a few options from my leftovers sock bin and he chose the navy blue and that is actually left over from a pair of socks I knit my mom so it is wool free it is Barocco comfy which is a cotton acrylic blend I believe maybe some nylon in there too and yeah so I am really pleased with how those turned out and I my flights were delayed so much that I ended up knitting the entire sock, one of the, the first sock in one day, and then getting a start on the second one. So I was able to finish the pair within two days, which was, I guess, once again, the upside. <laughs> um, I do have chronic pain issues, and so I had, I had to take a break from knitting after that because I had messed up kind of my arms and elbows and all that, but it was necessary to keep me sane, <laughs> so I'm very relieved that I'm able to bring knitting with me when I fly. Okay. I promise that will be the last time I complain about flying. Hold me to it. So the next pair of socks that I knit, these are all gifts by the way, is a pair for my friend Rich, who is very knit worthy. He loves hand knit socks. I have given him three pairs now and Debbie, who's also my friend, his wife, has reported that as long as they're doing laundry every week, he wears each of those pairs twice. So <laughs> clearly he needs some more pairs in his rotation. So I used a Knit Pick Stroll in the matcha colorway, which is a variegated green. And I really like how it looks. Let me get the focus there. I put the focus bar up too high. There we go. And as you can see, these are spider socks. So there's a big spider on the legs and then little baby spiders on the feet. I think this is my fourth time knitting this pattern, which is a free pattern from Ravelry. And I knit it once as socks for me, then I adapted it into a pair of mitts for my niece. Then I knit it as socks for Debbie, cause, so that was her Christmas gift last year. And Rich was really jealous. So I went ahead and knit a pair for him this year. I did knit, the other times I've adapted the pattern so that one sock has a big spider on the foot, but um, I was knitting these while I was home, and we were playing a lot of board games and, you know, doing a lot of chatting and socializing, and so I just didn't want to think about it, honestly, and so I just knit that as the pattern suggested, just because I didn't want to have to worry about the length. So, actually, all three of these socks are a 68-stitch count. So I don't think I had to adapt that for the pattern. I did adapt. The pattern calls for a kind of mock cable on the back instead of just plain 2x2 two two ribbing. But it's the back of a sock and I really like how the plain 2x2 two two ribbing uh, gives more give and it makes them a lot easier for me to knit because I remember that particular cable is a little hard on my wrists. I think it involves some twisted stitches or something. I don't know. Um, so I did make that modification, and then I just always do kind of my own thing with the heel flap and the toes. So I honestly don't know if this is different from the pattern or not, but I did a heel flap and gusset with just a slip stitch, and then I did the My Favorite Toe from a Knitty pattern that makes a nice kind of gradual rounded toe, and I went ahead and tapered all the way down because both Rich and Debbie have longer toes than Joel and I do. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm really happy with how they turned out. And they look stripier on camera than they do in person, but at least it's like a pleasing striping, right? This is one of those kind of sock knitting things that I'm just going to work in instead of making it its own segment, but I did want to talk about Knit Pick Stroll briefly. I haven't been able to do a yarn review on this because I've only used it for gift socks. So I haven't known how they wore, and I couldn't just show you how they'd worn. But Debbie and Rich came over last weekend, and Debbie had been asking if I had a link to any good darning tutorials because one of Rich's socks had developed a hole, and I said, oh, just bring it over and I'll darn it because I like darning, you know, and it's just, it's easier for me. Anyway. And so I was really impressed because... I think I gave him those socks for his birthday in 2017, so they're a year and a half old. Yeah, and as I said, he wears them one to two times a week, which is a lot of wear, and all they had was just a little hole 
like right around here. And it was really easy to deal with. It was just like the stitches splitting, almost like a steak. That's what it looked like, a little steak. And so I was really impressed by how little um, wear there was on the socks for that amount of time. I was worried when I started gifting people socks out of this yarn because it is a merino. It's a superwash merino nylon blend, and I wasn't sure how the merino would hold up. But it's also really soft, and I knit for a lot of people with sensitive skin. So I was like, well, at least they'll be able to wear it for a while. Um, but yeah, so now I'm really pleased to learn that it does, in fact, hold up to a lot of frequent wear. Obviously, the socks look worn. You know, they don't look fresh off the needles. But um, as long as they don't have holes in them, I think they're still socks. <laughs> so yeah, I just thought that I would let you guys know. And eventually... Um, I can do a review of it now because Joel's first pair of socks is knit out of Knit Pick Stroll. So in another six months or so, I think we'll hit the year mark. So I can go ahead and just show you his. And I think I had about 30 grams of yarn left over, maybe 25. I think this took around 75 grams. I didn't do any contrast heels or toes because I felt like this yarn was more tonal than variegated, more kettle dyed, and so in that case I think it looks good whether you do a contrast heel and toe or not. So that was my reasoning. It looks so much stripier on camera. Anyway, yeah. Sock pair number two, which they look so weird until you wear them and then they look good. <laughs> Should have gotten my sock blockers out. Sock pair number three are for Debbie. These are actually for her birthday. You've already seen her Christmas socks. They were the Mrs. Claus ones, but she is a February birthday and I've got three of those. So I like to just start my February birthday knitting as soon as Christmas ends. So these are out of Knit Pick Stroll Tweed in the Barn Heather? No, Farmhouse Heather, there we go. Which is a really pretty, cool chocolate brown and um, Knit Pick Stroll Tweed, I told you that. So it's a Superwash Merino Nylon Donegal Tweed Blend, and I think the Donegal Tweed is acrylic, so. But, um, I, I love tweed yarns, so. And I use the Hermione's Everyday Sock Pattern for this, although, as I said, I tend to do my own thing, so mainly I just use the stitch pattern from it, which actually showed up surprisingly well in the tweed. I wasn't sure if it would show up or not. I mainly knit it because I think this is such a comfortable stitch pattern to wear. I have a pair of Hermione's Everyday Socks and I just, I love wearing them. I should probably knit myself another pair actually. And um, I, so I really wanted to make her a nice cozy pair of socks. So I knit them with a pretty long leg. And once again, I just did the heel flap and turn. It's the rounder heel from um, the Sock Knitting by the Numbers chart. And it's funny since all of these socks, the six socks that I knit were all 68 stitch socks. So I managed to memorize it. I was saying before that I've never memorized the heel. And then I did the same toe as on Rich's socks. Just looks a little different. <laughs> and the only other change I made was I did the cuff on 72 stitches and then I decreased down to 68 for the leg and that was because Debbie can sometimes um, experience some swelling and so I just wanted to make sure that the socks were comfy since I was making them higher for her and yeah I'm so pleased with how these turned out I hope that they're a really nice cozy pair of socks for her to wear around the house she likes these kinds of colors too so and they were such a joy to knit. I love that kind of pattern. So these were my flying back socks. So I almost finished the first one on my flight back. And then I finished the second one over that weekend. So One of the interesting things for me is that when I travel, I suddenly become a monogamous knitter. And it's always fascinating how quickly projects can get finished when they're the only thing on your needles. <laughs> Especially when you have a lot of you know, downtime. So my final finished object is not a pair of socks. It is a cowl. And this is for my sister, one of my other February birthdays. So I'm ahead of the game this year. And 
I really love how this turned out. I'm calling it the perfect burgundy cowl, and I will tell you why in a moment. But it is knit using the Afia cowl pattern, which is a paid-for pattern from Hillary Cowlless Smith, something Smith. And she has several of these cowl patterns where they're designed to be almost like shawls, where there's a lot more fabric in the front than the back. And I really love these, and my sister loves them as well. So I've knit her two cowls from the Star Shower cowl pattern, which is by the same designer in this same style. And she requested a third one for her birthday <laughs> in Burgundy. And so while I was home for Christmas, I was like, you know, the designer does have other patterns. <laughs> so um, she looked at all her choices, and she picked this one. And I really like it. I think I'm definitely going to knit myself one. I like that there's a subtle little pico bind off. I'm sure it would be less subtle if I had pinned it out. I did block this, but I just laid it flat. I didn't pin it out. I was mainly blocking to get more smoosh here. And so this yarn is, oh, the price tag is over. So my sister and I went to my former local yarn store down in Texas and picked this out. And she was looking for a very specific color of burgundy, hence the name of the cowl. And so we started in the fingering weight, and we didn't find anything there. So then we went to the lace weight, and we found the exact color that she wanted. It matched her purse perfectly. She loved it. So that was a really good thing. And it is Filatura di Crosa, Golden Line Nirvana, made in Italy, color 32. And it's 100% extra fine merino. And I thought that it had not been super washed, but that's because the ball I was looking at when I bought it, I didn't quite see. So it has been super washed. Um, and there are 372 yards and 25 grams. So it is definitely a lace weight yarn. So I just held it double for the cowl and it took remarkably little yarn. So I balled up two skeins to hold them together because I was afraid they'd get tangled if I knit from this. And I had eight grams of each one left over, so that means it took 34 grams of yarn. And it looks kind of high in yardage because it's lace weight, so it's 500 something, but if you have that, I was really amazed at what, and I knit the large size, the pattern includes two sizes. I knit the large size, and I'm pretty sure I was on gauge, so I was really amazed at how good this pattern is at kind of maximizing your yardage and um, using a small amount of yarn to make a really lovely finished object. Sort of didn't want to take that off. It seemed to go with my outfit quite well. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you kind of the backstory. So my sister told me that she wanted a burgundy cowl when I was, before I placed my big knit picks gift knitting order during the um, Thanksgiving weekend sale. Excuse me. And so I showed her a few burgundy options on Knit Picks, and at the time she said she wanted to go more red versus more winey purple. Wine is in the drink, not as in I'm complaining. And so she settled on Knit Picks Capra DK in Ember Heather, which is definitely on the redder side, more brick. And then I brought this down to Texas with me as my final backup project and also just to make sure that it was the right color because I knew that she wanted to match a coat and then she has a purse as well. And it turned out that here's the difference, hopefully. It's a much more dramatic difference in person than I'm seeing on camera. But basically this is a lot more towards wine, purple burgundy, and this is more towards the brick red. So I... And she felt bad, but I was like, I can use this to knit a hat for Joel. We've been talking about knitting him a burgundy hat anyway. And so I have absolutely no problem with finding this. And it was on sale, so it was only $6 a ball um, at the local yarn store. No, it would have been less than that. I think $5 because there was an additional sale. Anyway, so we found this yarn, and there were five balls of it left. And so my sister just clutched them all to her chest and she's like, you could knit me a matching hat and mitts, you know, for future holidays. She's not one of those people who just expects me to knit on command. But <laughs> so it's pretty funny to watch her walking around the yarn store, just kind of clutching her yarn babies to her. So I did just go ahead and buy the remaining skeins. And as I said, the cowl took not very much at all. 
And so now I'm kind of tempted to start using it for me because this is a color that I like too. But I will go ahead and knit my sister all of her stuff before I break into her yarn. But yeah, it's funny when I entered it in my stash because it's five uh, balls of lace weight. So it's like 1,600 yards or something. <laughs> so suddenly I have a whole lot more yardage in my stash. But it was really fun getting to go to the yarn store with her and kind of explore all the options. And I was very proud of myself for not walking out with any other yarn. So, and I'm excited to knit this into a hat for Joel. I'm thinking maybe for Valentine's Day. You know, it seems color appropriate. And those are all of my finished objects. Okay, works in progress. Uh, first up, I have another sock. I know, but I mentioned on the last episode that I really want to knit some socks for me this year as well as Joel. So my goal is to knit one pair of socks a month and alternate who it's for. So since I had already knit Joel a pair, I decided the next one would be for me. And so I went ahead and wound up a skein of Quince and Company Finch, which is just 100% American wool. And it's not super wash or anything, but it's my favorite sock yarn in Peacoat, which is a very dark navy. And this is what I have of the first sock. So this ball of yarn has already been knit into a sock that I finished last night and decided was not the sock for me. So I immediately just frogged it back into the ball. And since it hadn't been knit for very long, the yarn was fine, I decided on its own. And decided to try another pattern. And I thought that I would mention that because for me, I'm at the point in my knitting where, I mean, I've always knit for fun, but I there was a time when I had very few hand-knit socks, and so I was trying to build up my knitting, my hand-knit sock collection, because I much prefer to wear wool socks, and so there was a time when, and it used to take me much longer to knit socks, obviously. I remember I used to be excited if I could knit one pair of socks working on it the whole month. And these days I can probably knit a pair in a week. Um, but so for all of those reasons, it is more important to me now to be very happy with the finished object than it is to just have the finished object. And so I finished knitting the sock, and it was actually the third pattern that I tried with this yarn. So I had already knit the sock like to about here twice with other patterns and decided that they weren't right and so the third time around I got to about the same point and I I didn't quite like it but I decided to keep going so I'm like no it's silly to rip it out again and I should always listen to that little voice in my head because if I keep going I just end up ripping more later but that's just a perpetual lesson I need to learn and uh, so I knit all the way to the toe and then I put it on and Whenever I finish a sock, I put it on my foot, and then I put my foot up on the coffee table so that I can admire it. And also because I have um, problems with my hips, so I have to spend a lot of the day with my feet elevated. So I end up looking at my hand and socks a lot. And instead of like experiencing that kind of rush of happiness and pride at my finished object and excitement about getting to wear a new pair of socks, I was just kind of disappointed. And... So that's why I decided to just rip it out and try a new pattern. And I've been watching a lot of the Netflix, the new Netflix show Tidying Up, which has Marie Kondo in it, and she is the one who wrote The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, and that was a best-selling book. So if you've heard her name before, it's probably from there. And I really enjoy the show. It's very relaxing, <laughs> but also inspiring, especially as someone who's going to be moving in the coming year, so I want to just set good patterns so that I don't get into crazy, untidy messes. Anyway, so whenever she, one of the things she makes people do is they have to touch every single one of their belongings, and they have to decide if it sparks joy or not. And if it sparks joy, then it stays, and if it doesn't spark joy, then you need to rehome it. And I realized that I do that in my knitting. And I think that's why I am happy to frog things if I've made a mistake, or happy to just rip out entire sweaters if they were right for me in the past, but I don't wear them anymore, and re-knit them into things that I want to wear now. This cardigan, in fact, 
which I don't think I mentioned, is my country mouse cardigan knit using the Audrey and Oost pattern. I love this. With Elsa Wool Cormo in wool and spun, fingering weight, medium gray. <laughs> uh, I love this cardigan so much. And uh, this yarn used to be a jumper, and I pulled it out because I have shoulder mobility issues, and so it's a lot harder for me to wear jumpers. And I re-knit it into a cardigan, and it just makes me so happy that I get to wear this. Anyway, so for me, I just I think that I use that kind of idea in order to evaluate my knitwear. And what's really great about evaluating knitwear this way is that if it doesn't spark joy, in most cases, unless I've steeped it or unless it's really worn, um, I... If I want, I can just unravel it and reclaim the yarn and it's something new. I don't always do that because sometimes it, uh, the yarn it just is bothering my skin or something else is going on. So in that case, I will rehome it. But I think that it's a really good place to kind of start with these kinds of practices because you don't have to feel wasteful because you can use the yarn again. So I know that sometimes when I hit, realize that I've bought something and it's not working for me and I should probably rehome it because it's not worth the space it's taking up. Uh, then I feel kind of guilty about the money I've spent and angry at my foolishness for spending that money on something that I don't even use and I can get into this very negative kind of cycle. Whereas whenever I've decided to rip out my knitting, I always feel really excited even during the process. During the process, sometimes I feel disappointed, but usually I'm already kind of content that I'm getting rid of what I didn't care for, and then as soon as I've got the yarn ready to knit again, I'm just so excited about imagining the new possibilities. Told you I was going to go on some <laughs> tangents today. And so uh, I realized a few things about why the first sock didn't work for me, so I'll just go ahead and share those in case you're interested. The major reason why the sock didn't work for me is because it was one of those patterns that has the interesting part running along the outside, so they're mirrored socks as opposed to all the way around the foot. And I think those look absolutely beautiful in project pages, and I'm always drawn to them, but it turns out when I put my feet up on the coffee table, I can't see the outer part of my foot. <laughs> so that means that I can't see the pretty part, and really I knit socks for me. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of the deal breaker for me. Also, the pattern, of course, called for stockinette in the rest, and I had changed that to three by one ribbing, and I did that because of some fit considerations that I've been contemplating lately. And while I think it, it was good as far as the fit goes, it just wasn't pretty. I don't know. <laughs> made me sad to look at it. So that's why I decided to kind of reevaluate and think about what I wanted from this pair of socks. It's always tricky for me when I'm knitting with very dark colors because a lot of patterns just won't show up. And Quince Finch is a very bouncy yarn. So the first pattern I tried was a knit pearl combination, but it was just too dark to see. Um, and so then, yeah, as I said, this is the fourth pattern that I've tried with these socks. And what I realized was that, first of all, I'm knitting these with a fairly short leg because I want to be able to wear them bare-legged with Oxfords in kind of the transitional months as well as over tights in the winter. And I think that it looks better with a slightly shorter cuff if I'm going to be wearing it over bare legs because I have short legs to begin with. So uh, having the sock end before the widest part of my calf just looks better proportionally. And so I realized that because of that, instead of picking a design that was more vertical, I should pick a design that was smaller so that you would see more of it in the leg. I also have decided that I, re I already knew that I really love the look of lace socks and especially in dark yarn because I have paler skin so that really creates a contrast when I'm just wearing it on its own and then over tights if I'm wearing colorful tights those colors peek through so I really like that effect so I decided to look for a small motif that was a lace pattern and then because of those fit considerations, I wanted it to include some ribbing, but to include it within the pattern itself so that I wasn't kind of forcing um, it upon the pattern, if that makes sense. So I went ahead and chose the Go With The Flow Socks by Evelyn Clark from 
Timeless Socks, Favorite Socks. It's an interweave book that my library has a digital copy of, so it was really easy for me to just borrow it on overdrive and get to knitting. And this is a 60 stitch sock pattern, which is my preferred stitch count when knitting with Finch. In the past, I've also knit with 56 stitch socks, like somewhere between 56 and 60. But I have also realized that my gauge is a lot tighter than it used to be, because when I knit this first sock, I measured the sole for plain stockinette, and I was finally getting eight stitches to the inch, and I never used to be able to get that with Finch. I measured another pair of socks, and I was at I did not quite seven stitches to the inch. I was at 13 stitches over two inches. Um, so I figured, since I was knitting a lot more tightly, even though it's a lace pattern, which usually means that it'll be a bit bigger, um, 60 stitches would be great. And so far I've got the cuff, which is this really interesting decorative, la decorative ladder stitch. And then I'm just beginning the body, which is also got a little bit of yarn overs. And hopefully this is the one. As I said, I'm knitting short legs, so it's not quite as much knitting to rip out. And I will just go ahead and try it on before I start the heel and be honest with myself. This is a new progress keeper, since I brought it right up near the camera. I've actually never bought myself a progress keeper before, like this style, that clip bomb. I do have a few, but they've all been given to me by friends, and so I really like that because I like remembering them. But Joel's mom gave me a gift card for Christmas, and I thought it would be really nice to spend some of the money on kind of a tangible object that would make me happy. And so I found this really pretty pressed flower stitch marker on Etsy, and I'll go ahead and include the link. And then the back has a tree. There we go. And that ties in with the word that I've chosen for this year, so I'll talk about that later. But yeah, I just arrived this morning, and I was so happy to clip it on. And in the past, I was kind of skeptical of fancy progress keepers just because I had my little locking stitch markers, and I'm like, well, I can use it for that, so, you know, <laughs> I don't need to be spending more money. But as I said, I do really like the ones that I have as gifts because they just make me feel warm and happy when I look at them. And because I usually have three projects going, and I've misplaced a couple of my progress keepers lately, so another one I decided would not be excessive. And I really like them when I'm knitting in the round, because that way it's essentially a start of the round marker, but without me having to slip anything on my needles, which the other stitch markers that sit on your needles do. So I just find it's the most convenient option for me. Um, when I'm beginning a project, I can track it by, you know, the the end of the cuff, but it just requires a little more mental energy, whereas I can see this without even really processing it, and so it just kind of simplifies things and speeds up my knitting. A couple people have asked about my needle holder, which is called a Knitsy. Unfortunately, I think the company went out of business. Their website is no longer on the internet, so I cannot help you with where to find these. I'm really sorry. Hopefully someone else will start making a similar type thing because that's disappointing. Um, and yeah, Whew. I actually, believe it or not, have more to talk about with socks, but I think I'll save that for next episode because I feel like I've been rambling on for quite a while and I am like through maybe half my content, so. <laughs> Let's see. Other works in progress. I only have one, and that's my tea party cardigan. Sorry about that. Okay. So, last time I showed you the body, sorry about the focus, which I had finished but then realized that I knit this part too long, so the arm side was going to be too deep. So I need to just go back and rip that out to shorten it. I have not done that yet, but... So the body is as you saw it, and I have moved on to sleeves. So I've got one sleeve with the full length knit, and I'm just about to start the sleeve cap. So that's this part. So um, that's when you bind off, and then you're knitting flat instead of in the round. And then I have this much of the second sleeve, which I actually knit first. I'm sorry. There we go. Talk about that in a minute. 
And I thought that I had also knit that to where I needed to bind off. This is, but when I remeasured, so I was knitting this at Joel's, and when I got home, I remeasured it based on my sweaters that I have because I want these to be nice long sleeves, and I think I'm going to go back and add just a few extra rows to the first one. But as you can see, I, yeah, there we go. So it needs maybe six more rounds, something like that. I haven't counted yet. But I've got the sleeves almost done up to the sleeve caps. So I'm making a lot of progress on these. And this yarn is Quince & Company Turn, which is 75% American wool, 25% Tussa silk, and Dusk, which is a beautiful mauve colorway. And this yarn is also reclaimed from another sweater. Apparently that's just my thing now. And I'm knitting it on size 4 needles. And they're just plain stockinette sleeves with a nice long 6-inch cuff of 1x1 one one twisted ribbing. I know for a lot of people, twisted ribbing is difficult, but I find it as easy to work as one by one ribbing, just because of the way I hold my needles, so, and I really like how it looks. I did a tubular cast on on these, which will match the tubular cast on that I did for the waistband of the sweater, and I'm also going to use a tubular bind off for the neck band and button band so that they all match, which this cardigan also has. Um, and the method I use is from the Tech Knitter blog. I really like it because it goes quickly. It's not fiddly once you've done it a couple times. The first, I would recommend doing it on either straights or double points versus circulars because it can be a little fiddly if you've got a cable involved. But um, And you don't have to guess how much yarn you're going to use, so that's really nice because uh, it makes me so sad when I'm doing a long tail cast on or a twisted German cast on and I run out of yarn and have to start the cast on all over again. But it does involve waist yarn, so that's why there's a little bit of yarn sticking out of the cuffs and then you just remove that. I can't remember if I've talked about why I wanted to do extra long cuffs. So I'm a short person and what length I have is in my torso, so I have extra short arms and legs. And so all the clothes that I bought growing up, the sleeves are always about to here, at least. <laughs> so to me, this is kind of where sleeves should be. I like it. <laughs> and when I started knitting sweaters for myself, you know, I knit them so that they fit right here. But it turns out that feels really skimpy to me. So I've decided I'm either going to knit three-quarter length sleeves, because I often pull them up. Okay, so this, even though it's technically the right length, I just... I want it to be a little bit longer, and luckily I can just pull it like that. But to me, this is how long sleeves should fit. Just realized how similar this sweater is. Um, and so I, but the issue is with that, that if I'm knitting a three-quarter length sleeve cardigan, I can get that out of 250 grams of fingering weight yarn. If I want to knit long sleeves, then I have to buy another skein of yarn. And that's usually, you know, another like $9 to $12 if I'm knitting a Quince & Company sweater. And so that's why I've started knitting more three-quarter length sleeve sweaters. Because, and it used to be when I was knitting full-length sleeves that were shorter, I, had, I was smaller. And so I could just eke it out of five skeins, usually playing some epic yarn chicken. But now, since I'm knitting a bigger bust size, there's just no way. Um, and... I'm generally happy with having three-quarter length sleeves, too, because they work really well for indoor wear, and that's where I spend most of my time. But with this cardigan, I happen to have a lot of the mauve yarn, because I started with a sweater's worth of it, minus whatever I lost from the uh, frogging process, and the body is knit in stripes. So I have a lot more of the mauve yarn just because I use stripes of the contrast colors. And so I figured since I have the yarn to do extra long sleeves, I might as well take advantage of that and make them nice and long and cozy. And because, so the reason why I decided to do extra long cuffs is first, I like that it snuggles. And second, that means that if I want to, instead of just pushing them up, I can go ahead and fold them back. I didn't twist the purl stitches, but my purl stitches tend to be a little neater in ribbing than my knit stitches anyway, so I think it looks just as nice on the inside is on the outside. So I just feel like it gives me more versatility. And so I really like how that looks. So 
I went ahead and cast on for, I think, eight inches worth based on my gauge circumference. Yes. And I didn't do any increases in the cuff, but then as soon as I hit this part, I started doing increases and I did them a little more frequently than I would if I had started lower down. So I did them every sixth row and I increased, so I started at 52 stitches and I increased to 78, which should be about 12 inches for my gauge. And I think my arms are 11 inches around, maybe 10 and a half, I don't know. It's the amount of, like, I've been experimenting with sweater fits last year, so that's how I know how big I want my bicep sleeve. So you can kind of see that progress there. And then I had knit myself a cotton cardigan last year with nice long sleeves and cuffs, so I was kind of basing it on that as far as making sure that the length was long enough. So, yeah, I just, I love knitting sleeves. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but... Just plain knitting in the round is perfect for knitting while reading or knitting while playing some board games or while chatting with friends. I just I really enjoy it. So these went quite quickly, although I did kind of procrastinate in the casting on process just because the one fiddly thing about the tubular cast on is that it requires a smaller size needle. And so that means I have to find my needle case and I wasn't at home. And so just making excuses. But now I'm on my way and... I slowed down for a couple days because I didn't want to take out my other sweaters and measure to make sure I was at the right length, but now I've done that too, so I am ready to start my sleeve caps. And hopefully I will have a finished sweater by the next time I show you because there is definitely a big break in the middle with this one and it would be nice to actually wear it. <laughs> so the clinking that you were hearing earlier is from my new yarn bowl, which I got for Christmas. And my niece painted it for me. So she and my mom apparently go to one of those ceramic studios where there are plain ceramics and then you pick them and you paint them and they fire them for you. And so she made me this and I love it so much. So she wrote, I heart you on the inside. And then she personalized it on the bottom. And then her theme was... Um, a winter landscape. So this is snow. It's a darker blue than it's showing because it's reflecting the light from my windows. And then she used some snowflake stencils, but as she told me, they were moving on her. And as I told her, that just makes it look more like snow. So it looks, I love this so much. And here's the yarn bowl part of it. I had never had a yarn bowl before because for a long time I caked all of my yarn. And so cakes don't move that much if you're pulling the yarn out from the middle. But lately I've been, I've switched to using yarn balls because I don't yank like this motion as much. And that was, wow, I should not have done that. I apologize. Anyway, so I realized that I was causing some problems with my neck and shoulders in the process of retrieving that yarn. But winding the yarn into a ball has alleviated but now I have a new problem of when I'm knitting, the yarn just wants to run away. So the yarn bowl works really well for that. And this is a 100 gram skein. And as you can see, there's plenty of room in there. And I'm just tickled pink about it. I thought it, it was such a surprise for a gift. And oh, it was so good. So I've been using it all the time. talk about some needle adjacent projects. So I'll go ahead and talk about this one first because I just showed you this yarn. So you saw this yarn last year at some point in a Schrodinger sweater segment. I have 900 yards of this. It's 100% organic merino. It's a beautiful two-ply fingering yarn. And it was hand dyed by Stacy Lee that I remember her name. She's one of my online friends. But I'm trying to remember what her yarn dyeing company was. Twisted Threads. Unfortunately, she is not selling yarn um, anymore, hand dyed yarn anymore. She is expecting a baby, and so um, I think she's just focused on that. But uh, she had sent me these two skeins of yarn, and so I was trying to decide what to do with them. And I definitely want to knit a short sleeve sweater. And as I mentioned on my last episode, one of my 
knitting interest for this year is to vary up what kinds of sweaters I knit, although I'll always be knitting little cropped cardigans. Anyway, um, so I thought that this would be a really nice start because it would give me an idea of how frequently I wear a short sleeve sweater. I'm planning to do elbow length sleeves, so not, not cap sleeves. But. And so because it's hand dyed, I want to go ahead and alternate the skeins, which is why I wound up all the yarn at once. And I have this little baby swatch which I was mainly doing to decide if I liked the fabric or not. I started on size zeros, which used to have been my default, but now that I don't knit so loosely, I decided that that was actually a little dense for what I was going for. So I ended up on size one and a half, and I really like how this fabric turned out. I just blocked it with the cowl, so I haven't actually measured gauge yet. And I think the colors are knitting up really pretty too. So, yeah. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and knit this in the round because since I'll be alternating skeins that is a little more fiddly and so rather than do that on both the front and back piece I think I'll just knit in the round to save myself a little bit of hassle and um, if there were going to be any pooling I think that that'll help cancel it out so my plan is to do as I said an elbow length pullover type sweater and I'm definitely going to do some type of centered panel because as much as I love wearing cardigans there are so many sweaters that I love the look of that are jumpers or pullovers um, because they have that nice centered panel and that just doesn't work in a cardigan because of the button down. So I'm really excited to be able to do that. I think I'm just going to go ahead and make up my own pattern because I've got some really lovely stitch pad, stitch books, stitch dictionaries. There we go. And so I can draw some inspiration from those. I'm especially thinking about looking at the Japanese stitch knitting Bible because this is a really nice two-ply yarn. And it's not super tightly spun. So I think it'll look really good in lace. Like you can even see I did a little yarn over just to tell myself the needle size in case I forgot. And that shows up nice and round. So I think that this would be really suited for lace knitting. And a lot of her patterns involve some lace knitting, but I don't want it to be so lacy that I need to wear a camisole underneath, so it'll be an interesting balancing act there. And then I'm going to use this yarn, which is O-Wool Fingering Weight, which is 100% U.S. Merino organic as well. And this has also been not super washed. It's a different treatment that's more environmentally friendly and takes place in the U.S., I think she calls it O-washing. Um, and this is in the Appalachian colorway. And this is the leftovers from my Celestarium shawl, which I knit last summer. And I'm looking at it on my couch right now. So I'm going to use this for a contrast round collar, Peter Pan collar, on the top of the sweater and probably contrast ribbing on the sleeves, the sleeve cuffs. I had thought about doing some color work but first of all, I have to pull it over my head, and my shoulders are much broader than my waist, so if I did any color work around my waist, I would be worried about stretching, like, float issues. And also, I can do color work on cardigans, but I can't do that centered panel, so that is the plan. So that's going to be the sweater that I cast on for after I finish my tea party cardigan. Um, I like to start plotting them ahead of time, which I learned from Jenny over at Tiny Paper Foxes, because then I can just go ahead and start as soon as I've got some time. So I'll probably, I knit this while spending some time with my two really good friends here watching Pride and Prejudice. We watched the 1995 miniseries, all five hours of it, in one glorious afternoon during the holiday. And we had mimosas, and we're all knitters now, so we all knit. And so I worked on this. And yeah, I'm really excited about this. Uh, prepare to see a lot of pink this year, by the way. <laughs> and if you don't like pink, then that might be a problem. My other needle adjacent project is my final February gift knit. So I went ahead and balled up all of the yarn. And I'm going to knit Kylie, my niece. Oh, I don't know if I've used her name before. That's okay, though. She's got an Instagram account, so. Um, a Hedwig for her birthday. She's turning 13, so I think this is probably the last softie that I'll knit her 
not because she doesn't still love softies, but because she has every softie that I've ever knit her. And <laughs> I told her that I was okay with her, you know, donating them or anything if she wanted more space, but she's very attached to them all. So I, I don't want to clutter up her room. So I thought I would go out on a bang, basically, and um, Dot, Pe Dottie Pebbles Knits does these really interesting animal patterns, and she offers one free on, I think, like, the first Friday of the month or something, and I happened to find out about her when she was offering a snowy owl pattern for free. So I went ahead and added that to my library, and um, I thought it would just be perfect, as I want one for myself, but... First, I'll knit one for my niece, and so it called for um, heavier yarn. This is a bulky weight, stranded together with mohair, and because it's a snowy owl, sometimes you use white and sometimes you use black. This obviously is more white than this, but I think that together they'll still look owl-like, and these are all Knit Picks yarn. They were all part of my gift knitting order back around Thanksgiving, and eh, I'm trying to remember... This is some kind of fuzzy brushed alpaca, I think. Hey, it'll all be linked in my stash. And then this is the mohair silk blend, the lace weight, which is what the pattern calls for in both white and black. But unfortunately, Knit Picks went out of stock in their black. So I just went ahead and ordered some lace weight alpaca. And that's why I went for the fuzzy main body yarn. So hopefully it'll still be fuzzy even when it doesn't have the um, mohair. And mohair is a little, or an alpaca is a little bit fuzzy on its own, too. So I balled up all that yarn, which was quite a bit of winding, just because lace weight. But since whenever I'm holding yarn doubled, I want it to behave as easily as possible, and it just seems to behave best in um, this form where, versus kind of this sloppiness, which this starts to happen. So I think it's worth it. And then I saw that the pattern called for size 10 needles, which I don't own, but luckily my friend Christy, what's going on with the focus? There we go. My friend Christy, um, one of the ones I watched Pride and Prejudice with, did have size 10 needles, so she has lent me those. I got them yesterday, so I should be casting on soon. I'm a little nervous about how it's going to go, but hopefully I will be able to follow the pattern and end up with a really nice snowy owl. I do have some like flexible wire that I think I'm going to put in her claws to make them extra grippy. And then I might or might not use the other set of glow in the dark eyes that I got when I was ordering them for Joel's octopus. I ordered another set for my octopus, but maybe I'll use those for Hedwig instead. If I'm feeling generous. Yeah, so those are my two needle adjacent projects that I should have on the needles by next episode. Let me know, this is a new thing for me, and if it feels redundant, because I'm going to show them as works in progress later, just let me know. But sometimes I'm just excited, so I thought it might be fun to kind of channel that early excitement for you all. On to Schrödinger's sweater, which is my segment where I show you a yarn from my stash and talk about possible projects I could do with it and ask for your input. So this beautiful skein is Shirsty Cat Designs by Kelly Straw, BFL Sock, 464 yards and 100 grams, 75% superwash BFL, 25% nylon, in the Frisian colorway, Frisson. And... This was my Christmas present from my friend Kristen, who is the one who organized our Pride and Prejudice Mimosa extravaganza. And she is a new knitter, but she has dove right in. <laughs> and I think this is such a pretty skein of yarn. So I love all these colors. It's pinks and purples and then splashes of gold and cream. I think it's really beautiful. So I had not unwound it before, but I wanted to show it to you because... Presumably some of you have a lot more experience with hand-dyed yarn than I do, and I have no idea how this is going to knit up. It looks like it wasn't reskained, which is actually nice for trying to figure out how it's going to knit up. So let me know if you have any thoughts first on that. So, oh, it's so pretty. Look at that right there. Okay, so... Um, 
I have a few possibilities with this. I was thinking that I could knit a cowl out of it, like the Afia cowl that I showed you earlier. I could also use it to knit a bigger cowl or big scarf with by combining it with some other colors of yarn in my stash, and I think that that would be a really nice option. Um, I knit a three color scarf who's I can't remember the pattern name earlier this year in like blues and purples and I ended up giving it to my sister for Christmas and once I blocked it oh my gosh it was so beautiful it was a garter stitch and garter mesh lace and it just blocked out to this uh, really delicate drapey just gorgeous thing and it was over 11 feet long it was massive and so I definitely would not mind having one of those. And I know that BFL is a nice drapey yarn, even when it's not been super washed. Um, so I think it would behave really well as some kind of neckwear. So those would be two possibilities. And I could either knit that same scarf that I knit for my sister, whose name I can't remember. I'll put it in show notes. But I also have a pattern from... Oh my gosh, my brain is going. No, I have another pattern that's designed for using multiple color or multiple skeins of yarn in order to knit a giant pashmina style scarf wrap, which are my favorite kinds of scarves. And so I could use that as well, or some kind of, you know, two loop cowl, which I've knit several of, if you know what I'm talking about, the usual cowl type that I knit versus the apia type. Um, so this and maybe one other contrast color, but I'm not sure. Obviously, I think a lot of colors in my stash will go really nicely with it. But because the colors in the skein have so many different values, so there, there's the pale cream, but then there's also um, fairly dark purples. So I'm not sure what color I would use for contrast, but it does seem like this is much darker in value than all of them, so I could use a color like this. So maybe that would look nice. I have a very similar yellow skein in my stash, as well as a very similar mauve skein, if I wanted to kind of color match it. I'm just not sure how to use hand-dyed yarn, because I almost never buy it. I think I've bought myself one skein of hand-dyed yarn in my knitting career. Um, but yeah, so maybe I'll just steal my sister's yarn. <laughs> because that looks quite nice. Or the other option would be to use it in color work. And I could either do a color work cowl, kind of knit as a tube in the round, so that the wrong sides you don't have to worry about. Um, in which case I would definitely have to pay attention to value, but it looks like this is probably the darkest of the dyeing. And I think it's still light enough that it would work if I picked a dark color. but. There are a couple color work patterns out there that I would love to have as sweaters, and I think two would work with this. First is an actual sweater pattern that I found about from found out about from Katie Greenbean, who, if you have not watched her podcast, you are in for such a treat. You should go watch it. She's so calming and soothing, and she's an artist as well as a knitter, and so she shows um, herself working on her art and her knitting, and ugh. I love her podcast as well as her Instagram feed, and she's also got a little scruffy dog, so, and she knits the most amazing things. Anyway, she put this Triceratop sweater on her, like, make nine list for this year. I love Triceratops. They are my favorite dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> so I got very excited when I discovered the existence of a Triceratops sweater, and I think that this yarn would be pretty cool Triceratops. Maybe I've got, actually, for Christmas, I received a sweater's quantity of Quince & Company Chickadee in this really dark pea coat. So I could knit a navy sweater with very colorful triceratops. Or, yeah. And then the other one that I was thinking about, which once again would go with the navy, is I knit some seahorse socks a couple of years ago now, I think, um, for Debbie. And I've been wanting to adapt them as a cardigan pattern. And I think that this yarn would make incredible seahorses, too, also with navy. So, yeah, I'm really torn. I don't know what to do. 
And Kristen was asking me if I had decided what to do. And I'm like, no, because I need more crowdsourcing thoughts. So let me know. What do you think this yarn should be? Should it be Triceratops? Should it be seahorses? Should it just be a beautiful neckwear piece? Would it look best on its own? Like this? Oops. Or would it look better with some contrast colors? Maybe I need to get some plum yarn for a Triceratops sweater. No, I don't need to buy more yarn. That's not an option. <laughs> but I do have a very similar color in BFL yarn that I am reclaiming. Um, so I could definitely, and it's too scratchy for me to wear as a cardigan. Um, BFL is quite a soft yarn. It's just my skin is really sensitive. So if it's not a fine wool, then I can't wear it in sleeves. But that's okay. I have other things to do that. I can wear it as neckwear. So I could definitely do um, some kind of neckwear with this as a contrast color. Maybe I need a Triceratops cowl. But yeah. Or if you've got other ideas for patterns that you think this yarn would look good in, if you have any ideas about how it's going to knit up color-wise, I want to hear them. That's really what this is about, crowdsourcing and helping me narrow down my options that way, because sometimes that can be overwhelming. I, what I love about knitting is how much I can customize what I want, assuming I can afford it. But that can also, it can get to the point where you have so many choices for everything that you're going to make, especially if, like me, you just kind of make up things as you go or adapt, that I end up with kind of choice paralysis. <laughs> They've done studies on this. The human brain does not like having to choose between too many options. We prefer fewer options. So at least I'm not alone. But yeah. And I love this yarn so much, so I'd like to get knitting with it this year so poor Kristen can see her gift being used. <laughs> That's almost all the knitting content, but before I let you go, I wanted to bring up issues of race and diversity that have been an ongoing topic of discussion in the online knitting Instagram community over the last couple of days. I'm recording this on Thursday, January 10th. And... I am going to include links down below so that if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go ahead and read the words for the knitters of color themselves because it's important that I not kind of take over what they're saying or throw my own opinions in when what I really need to be doing is listening and learning from them. So I'm going to include those links down below. But essentially the context is that the online knitting community needs to be safer for knitters of color. That was my takeaway from this. And so I have decided to invite people to join me in working through a book that was designed by a person of color for white people who <laughs> want to get better about race relations. And I'm assuming that all of you want to get better because why wouldn't you want to make a safer space? And so this is called the Me and White Supremacy Workbook by Layla Saad. It is available for free. You just need to register on her site. There's a link in the email for PayPal donations, and I'm going to go ahead and do that because I would feel uncomfortable profiting from all of her hard work without paying her something for it. But if you are in an economic situation where you can't afford to buy books, I just wanted to let you know so that you didn't just assume that you wouldn't be able to participate because of finances. And I'm just going to go ahead and read my Instagram caption because... It's, I think I'm a little more eloquent in writing than just when I'm speaking off the cuff. So this is my invitation to all of my white knitting friends, who I'm guessing a lot of you are watching right now, to join me in doing this work. Okay. The more knowledgeable the white knitting community is about race issues, the safer the community will be for all of the BIPOC knitters and crafters, and that is Black Indigenous People of Color, if you haven't heard that acronym before. I see a lot of posts talking about how cozy and relaxing the online knitting world is and escape from the stresses of the offline world, especially politics. Sadly, this is only true if you have white privilege, because then you can ignore posts or comments that, regardless of conscious intent, harm BIPOC makers. It's time for us white women to take responsibility for our obliviousness and work to change that. Without this work, the online community cannot be inclusive. The ones with the privilege are the ones causing the problem. Not on purpose but that's just what's happening. 
I'm so grateful this workbook exists, and I hope many of you will join me in working through it. So that is my invitation to you. If you're feeling angry or embarrassed or just really upset at the idea right now, I encourage you to push past that. And I will include some links down below in case you've never heard of white privilege and the idea is entirely new to you so that you can read about it. I'm not going to get into a major discussion in the comments of this video about that. Um, just because I have a, lim a limited amount of ability to type. My hands don't like to type very much because of my illnesses. And so since I've been discussing it on Instagram and since I'm trying to run this discussion group on Instagram, I need to save my typing for there. It's So I am going to be moderating these comments. And if you leave a comment that is denying racism, denying white privilege, or informing me that because I've mentioned this, you are no longer interested in watching my channel, I'm going to delete that comment. And that is because I want my YouTube channel and my Instagram account to be safe places for everyone. And if you're leaving a comment denying the existence of racism, that's harmful to people of color because you're denying their experiences and you're essentially calling them liars. And so that is why I'm going to moderate comments, not because I don't believe in freedom of speech, not because I want to persecute people who don't agree with me, but because this is my space. It's like, it's my home. And I am valuing the safety of people over the right of other people to share their opinions. So I'm just saying that now so that you don't waste time typing a comment that then has to be deleted. And you're perfectly allowed to disagree with me. Obviously, if you unsubscribe because I'm talking about this, then that's within your rights. But I would encourage you if you're feeling angry or upset or frustrated or just like, oh, here we go again. I just wanted to think about knitting. I didn't want to think about politics to really think about how nice it is to be able to not think about politics and how your skin color is what's allowing you those spaces. And the only way that we can make a space that is comfortable and relaxing for everyone is if we're aware enough to not make things that, or to not say things that politicize the community for knitters of color, even if as a white knitter, I don't realize that I'm politicizing things. I hope that that makes sense. And I am not trying to lecture or place myself above anyone. I'm just passing on this information and inviting you to go on this journey with me to basically become um, more successful as an anti-racist person. And I think that that's a great goal for everyone and hopefully most of you agree with me. So after all of that, I am going to go ahead and talk about my word for the year, but that's going to be entirely personal. It's not going to be related to knitting. So if you're only here for the knitting, then it was great to see you. Thank you so much for spending some time with me and I will hopefully see you again very soon. In case you haven't heard of it before, the idea of picking a word for the year is basically, you're trying to think of kind of a theme word or a guiding word that will help you make decisions and prioritize things in the upcoming year. So I personally do not do New Year's resolutions, not because I don't find them valuable, but because I find winter, I'm much more interested in kind of cuddling into myself versus expanding out. And so I save resolutions for my birthday, which is in April and it's spring and I'm feeling more energetic and I'm more interested in um, those kinds of oh, what can I change about my life to make it better kind of things. Whereas in the new year, especially the week between Christmas and New Year's, I absolutely love, I find it a very liminal, liminal? Don't really know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> Time of year. This is what happens in most of your vocabulary comes from reading. Uh, and so I certainly want to be thinking about kind of reflecting on the year behind me, reflecting on the year upcoming. I really enjoy that. 
but I don't want the pressure of trying to make specific goals for myself. And instead, what I love about picking a theme word is that it feels like a way to help crystallize my thoughts, but in sort of a gentler method. And that really works for me at this time of year, because especially, um, I love the holidays. They're a very good time for me. I know that they aren't for everyone and that I'm lucky to have that, but even though they're good, they're also always exhausting. Uh, pleasantly exhausting. <laughs> so it's really nice to just have that relaxation and focus time for me. And especially the Advent season as well can be a very thoughtful time. Um, anyway, so that's why this works for me over resolutions. But of course, you should do what works for you. And last year, the word that I chose was cultivate. And I really wanted to cultivate relationships. I wanted to kind of cultivate my space. And it's funny because I did end up doing a lot of cultivating, but what I did the most was cultivating myself because after, gosh, I think six years, eight years of being single, I started a relationship and that requires work. And it's good work. I'm a better person than I was last year but it's not always easy work and so I had to change a lot of things about myself and also learn how to relate to another person in that kind of context. Um, I did a lot of reading, I did, <laughs> it was a lot of cultivation essentially and so I think it's sort of ironic that even though I chose that word because I wanted something focusing on relationships, I was more looking at relationships, and it turned out that really I needed to cultivate myself more than anything. So when, I, when it came time to look for a word for this year, I realized that I'm actually in a pretty good place. I, I really like where my life is right now, and as I said, I'm a better person than I was a year ago, and I mean, I don't want to completely rest on my laurels, but I do kind of want to give myself a break from that kind of self-actualizing. Uh, so it was tricky to try to find a word that worked with that. At the same time, even though, I guess what I was trying to say, I'm just going to say it a different way, is that last year was a lot of time of new growth. New growth within myself, new growth with relationships, new growth with hobbies. I became interested in board gaming and just kind of let my obsessiveness run in that direction. And so this year, I'm, I don't feel the need to do lots of growing, right, or lots of cultivating in that sense. And at the same time, I am going to be moving in this year, and obviously that's going to be a very large change, and I want to make sure that um, I handle that with as much emotional grace as possible. <laughs> moving is always chaotic, but, you know, I don't want to lose this sense of groundedness that I have right now. And um, so I was trying to think of a word that would both be inspirational for the move, but also for the rest of the year, and one that would kind of allow me to recognize all of last year and perhaps expand on it, but not, I don't, I don't want to change a lot right now other than my moving, obviously. And so the word that I finally decided on is rooted. And <laughs> It has been brought to my attention. This means something else in Australia, possibly New Zealand. So feel free to giggle. <laughs> I, I won't be repeating it a lot. Just <laughs> So the reason why I chose this word is first, I think it follows really well from cultivate, right? It's And it also still has kind of those plant and tree connotations. And I'm just, I'm a tree person at heart. I love them. <laughs> Whenever I need to meditate, I imagine myself in a forest. It's just, it's a very spiritual center for me. So anything tree related is always going to be good for me as a theme. And I also feel like I can allow everything that I did last year in pursuit of cultivation and growth. Now is the time to let it take root, right? And Things can take root and grow deep and get strong, and you don't necessarily see a lot of disruption or change, but it's going on inside, and so that really appealed to me as well. And then, of course, moving 
into a, a new place, um, into Joel's home, which he owns. It's not a rental. And so I'm putting down more roots just here in this local area, which is something very new for me because I grew up in a military family. So I grew up moving and not moving houses, but moving actually often countries <laughs> and then states. I've actually never moved to a different place in the same city before. So that will be a new experience. But I feel like I really found a place where I would be perfectly happy living here for the rest of my life and that's very novel for me because especially in my early to mid 20s I really wanted to be able to keep moving and the fact that now I'm in a place where it's okay to be still and I think that that's another aspect of roots you you know the deeper they are the stronger they are but the trickier they are to transplant so for all of these reasons, that's why I've decided that this is a good word for me for 2019, and I'm really excited to see what takes root. I also like the idea of going back to some of my roots. For example, I started my Instagram account in order to record all of the good things about my life because my life is quite circumscribed by my illnesses and that's okay. It's there's so many wonderful things within those limitations. And it's a lot easier for me to stay happy and balanced and centered if I'm focused on that instead of on all of the things that I can't do. And so that's what I imagine my Instagram account at the beginning as a kind of visual gratitude type journal. And over the last couple of years as I have started this um, podcast and connected with more online knitters and now I'm getting into board gaming it feels like it kind of the tone of my account has shifted a little and I don't think that's a bad thing but I also think it would be really nice to kind of get back into the rhythms of how I used it in the beginning so um, I it's, it's a tricky balance because I also don't want to feel as if my account is saying, oh, look at how lucky I am. I, I never want, I don't know, I don't want to make it sound like I'm bragging or anything like that. And so it feels like as I get more followers, I become more self-conscious of what I post. But I don't know. I'll find a happy medium. It's got to be there. I warned you I was going to get kind of more introspective. <laughs> And not at all related to knitting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I wanted to share that with you because I was listening to the latest episode of Imagine Landscapes, which is uh, my favorite, one of my favorite audio knitting podcasts. And it's hosted by two sisters, Sarah and Katie, and they both pick words for the year. And it, they had this really wonderful discussion about it. And it was, what was even nicer was that Katie was expressing a lot of the same things that I felt at the end of the year when I'm trying to pick a word and that she doesn't, yeah, it was just, it was really great. And I love the word that she chose. I'm not going to spoiler it for you. You can go listen to it yourself. I'll include a link down below. Um, but yeah, so really looking forward to 2019. And I guess I'm kind of, I feel like a, the year is starting out in a good place. And hopefully things will only get better, at least until I have to pack up all of my belongings. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this episode. It was very chatty. I've missed you all. And I, I don't know, I'm in a chatty mood. And as always, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to keep up with me in between episodes, I'm also the charm of it on Ravelry and over on Instagram. I'm definitely most active on Instagram. I love to get comments from you. And I've never moderated comments before, in case you were wondering. It's just something that I thought I'd bring up because I've been thinking a lot about it in this, these past few days and what the balance is between allowing people to express their thoughts, but also making a safe space. And also part of this last year and cultivating myself has been really the recognition that just because you have an opinion or a feeling and it's, you know, it's your opinion, it's your feeling, it's perfectly valid, but that doesn't mean you need to share it with others. 
that's not actually <laughs> an essential part of every feeling that you own is to share with others. And I think that a lot of times in uh, at least U.S. society, which is the one I can speak to most easily, there's the sense of individualism and that if you don't share every feeling, you're going to be all bottled up and then it'll explode. But I don't think that's always true. And especially if you're feeling very overwhelmed by a negative feeling or emotion, sometimes it can be good to just sit with that for a while and let that go, let that kind of, you know, simmer in the back of your mind until it becomes more thought about, at least, as opposed to just immediately sharing whatever is on your mind right in that moment. Um, I'm kind of paraphrasing from a book by Terry Reel, which I will also include down below. It's, it's meant as a couple's book, but I think it's incredibly useful for all relationships and just for how to be a more emotionally mature person. So <laughs> as someone who doesn't usually read self-help books, I found it very interesting and thoughtful and useful. So I'll include that link down below too. I can't remember the exact title name, which is why I'm not naming it here. And after that final digression, goodbye. I'll see you again soon.